different grab the three.
Can you guys hear me in Los Alamos? Can you hear me? Yes? Can you say something to me? Yeah, we can hear you. Do you hear an annoying twiddly noise? Funny. It's funny. Yes. <laughs> yes? Yes. You're, you do hear an annoying twiddly noise. Yeah, but we always hear it up here. <laughs> but we've never experienced this before. <laughs> it must be terrible for you guys. <laughs> It'll drive me crazy if nobody else. <laughs> Can, you, can she make it go away completely instead of just turning it down? <laughs> what, what did you say? Can you make the noise go away completely? You made it softer, no. but it's still uh, there. If I make it go away completely, then you can't hear them because their sound comes through these speakers. And it's uh, feedback from the speakers which is making know, the total noise? I don't know about that. That's for you. I don't know what it is. I, I can call the engineers and ask them exactly. That would be great because this didn't happen last year. Oh, and it didn't happen oh, last yes. week, actually. Let me ask them if there's anything else that can be done. Okay. If they, yeah, if they could make it the way it was last week, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, you know, I thought we'd get right into the swing of things, having a homework due this Thursday, you know, no point in, uh, you know, no point in lulling you into a false sense of security. Um, I have office hours today after class and then again tomorrow from 2 to 3, So, and, and I'm also happy to answer questions by email. There's one or two things in the homework that, um, that we should talk about today. So, um, so first of all, equivalence classes, right? So this is some stuff from the discrete math courses that you took 20 or 30 years ago <laughs> that you may have forgotten. Uh, what are the rules of an equivalence class? An equivalence is a, uh, it's something which we'll call twiddle. Uh, it's um, transitive, so if this and this is true, then this is true. It's symmetric, so if A twiddle B, then B twiddle A. It's reflexive, so A twiddle A. That's the last time I will say reflexive or transitive or symmetric in this class. Um, it's a notion of equality, right? That's why we call it equivalence. So um, this definition that uh, given a language L um, and given two words that are written in the input alphabet here, this definition that U and V are equivalent, which I'll, I'll call twiddle sub L because, I mean, each language creates a different type of equivalence. Um, if... Uh, for all, which I like to abbreviate this way, for all other words, W, U followed by W is in the language if and only if V followed by W is in the language. So for example, uh, let's, take some, let's take some regular language like, you know, A and B, and let's say that uh, the rule is Are you hearing anything now? It's better. It's going away now. Okay. Thank you. Um, so let's take this alphabet, and I don't know, let's say L is the set of words such that um, each A is followed by at least two Bs immediately. I don't know. It's a simple language. Okay. So for instance, this word is legal and this word is not. Okay. I mean, take any example. So what are the equivalence classes? So the equivalence classes are you know, once you say that things are equivalent in a certain way, that clumps certain words together. So what are the clumps? Okay, it's the equivalence will carve up the set of all words of A's and B's into certain clumps where within clumps everything is equivalent, but words from different clumps are not equivalent. And these clumps are called the equivalence classes. 
Okay. So um, uh, let's take a few examples. So name, describe in English one of the equivalence <coughs> classes of this equivalence for this language. So again, two words, which for all purposes of what you can legally follow them with, they're equivalent. You mean, you know I say like what's you and what's V probably? Well, I want you to give me a group of words which are all equivalent to each other and by this definition. Words that end with A? Yeah. Words that end with A. <coughs> Uh, that are legal so far? Oh, okay. Or, yeah, or yeah. just single, simply legal and illegal strings. Mm -hmm. Well, but I don't think all the legal ones are equivalent, though. Mm -hmm. Right? I think that some legal ones can be followed legally by different things than other legal ones. Yeah. So they wouldn't be equivalent. Right? So let's, let's take what you said as, as one of them. Words that end with A and I will add, are legal so far. Uh, in fact, yeah, so the things that are legal so far, there will be several types. So name another type. So legal so far means there hasn't already been an A that wasn't followed by at least two Bs, except maybe this last one. But it's, it's not illegal yet. I mean, we could follow, we could fix it, right? We could add more Bs. Okay. Not clear? So do you agree that if I've read the first part of a word, so remember these machines read words from left to right. So I've read the first 27 symbols. There's some more to come. I don't know how much. So do you agree that if you know this about what you've read so far, even if this is the only thing you remember about what you've read so far, that if I now give you more symbols, you can tell whether the whole thing is legal or not? Right? So for instance, something of this form has to be followed by something that starts out BB. Yeah. You're in the middle, in a, in a state in the middle in this case. Yes, we're not done reading the word. Okay. We've, run, we've read the first part of the word. Okay. okay. We are, it should probably read them words that end with A and were legal before the A. Uh, and, and are legal. This, at this current state, it's not a legal word. You're right, it's not legal yeah. if we start here. Yeah, it's, it's uh, so not the accept state. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, but before... Before the A. Before the A. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, no makes sense. Okay. Right, okay. we might be able to get back to a legal state, but right at the moment we're not. Exactly, yeah. Okay. Right, but we're not, we're not, um, we're not doomed. Whereas if we see ABA or AA somewhere, then nothing, the way this rule is written, then there, nothing can recover from that. So here we're still, we're in purgatory. We could still be redeemed. Okay. Um, all right, so what are some other groups like this? Uh, like with the other two be like A, B? And B. So let's call group two, again, legal, except, you know, I mean, not, not doomed, not irrevocably illegal. Uh, and and end in a what? Uh, with B, one B. Uh, but I'm not sure if this qualifies as a clump, as an equivalence class. Because you can have many Bs before, and you can just have one A before B. That's why. Um, from uh, let's see. Does this actually? This might. Does it? Um, if you have an A before, then you need another B. Uh, maybe this is one actually. If if we demanded a bunch of Bs, if we demanded like three Bs, then ending in A B would be different from ending in B B. Right. We would need to know 
how far back the last A was. In this case, maybe you're right. Just two letters to be back. Yeah, maybe this one is okay. So legal so far ends in a B. Uh, okay, and then what's another clump? If we're right that these are both clumps, then we've covered everything which is legal so far. Yeah. Oh, wait, wait. No, we need to know whether it's legal if we stopped right now. Right? So the problem with this is that if we have this and we stop right now, it's, it's illegal. Yeah. But if we have this and we stop right now, it's legal. We have to count. Like, to count uh, yeah, so maybe we should divide this into ending in, uh, well, you tell me. How should we divide this up to make equivalence classes? Ending in A, B, or ending or B, B. So <coughs> let's say ending in B, B. Uh, group three will be legal so far and ending in A, B. Uh, uh, legal before the A, B. Before the AB. But yes. Number two is fine. Legal before the AB. Um, and what else? Oh, some just illegal things. Yeah, what about, you know, we've already, so we'll call these doomed. So, in other words, you've already seen two A's that are too close together. So there's nothing you can do to fix that now. The rule is going to be, has been violated. All right, so uh, there's one thing that we haven't done, which is what about things where, what about B, just B? Right, but I mean, does it need its own group? <coughs> I mean, for that matter, what about the empty word? Depending on the machine, they could just be lumped in with uh, words that end with BB. I think you're right. So I, I think this one should end in BB or just B or we've read nothing at all so far. We're at the very beginning of the process. Okay? So I think this is right. Because we should be able to describe now uh, what each of these types of words could be legally followed by. And if we can do that, then we've really successfully divided up the universe of all possible words into four clumps. So that the only thing you need to know at each stage as you read from left to right, the only thing you need to remember about what you've read so far is which of these four categories it's in. Okay? So let's see. I, I think that's right. I mean, if it ends with A, you have to start with two Bs. And then, in addition, follow the rules after that. Here, you can actually do anything you like from here, <coughs> as long as you don't violate the rules somewhere down the line. Here, what do you have to start with? A single B, and after that, anything you like. And here, nothing you do will make any difference. So you don't really, you don't need to remember anything other than, I'm doomed, I'm doomed, I'm doomed. Okay? <coughs> so the point of one of the homework problems which is written in a slightly abstract style. No. <laughs> uh, but the point of one of the homework problems is that this language, because it has these four equivalence classes, can be recognized by a deterministic finite state automaton with four states, where each state corresponds to what you've read so far is in one of these classes. So let's let's build it. Okay. Yes. I have a question. The last class we were talking about to exclude some states, some invalid states from the graph, like don't put in, in, the, in your graph some valid states. And um, but this was for non-deterministic ones, you mean, uh, or maybe, uh, uh, maybe we could say I I don't remember exactly, but I, re I remember we talked about if some invalid combination of strings you can exclude from the from the state. Don't put that states. Okay, or oh. Oh, we, we had an, uh, um, we have an example, I don't remember, it's like the example with 
summer rules to one side. And we can, I said we don't need these edges. Yeah, yeah. And my question so is, is, if I am defining equivalent classes, uh, what happened with the invalid states? I should yeah, classify yeah, yeah. them. So I, I, know, I know what you're saying. So first of all, this picture of each state corresponds to an equivalence class. This is really a picture of DFAs, deterministic finite set automata. NFAs can actually be much more compact. They can actually have fewer states than there are equivalence classes, which is kind of surprising. And, so, and one of the homework assignments, one of the homework problems uses that fact. So it says, you know, look at one of these examples in Sipser and try to generalize it and come up with a language, um, or rather a sort of series of languages where uh, there's an NFA with only three or four states, but the smallest DFA needs to have eight states. And in general, for each K, there's a language where an NFA needs K or K plus one states, but a DFA needs two to the K states. Now, what I did, what you're referring to, is when we had, um, in some cases, if we had an NFA and the, you know, we had a legal transition which took us to a reject state. I said, well, we might as well instead say there is no legal transition from here because the definition of an NFA is it, it accepts a word, it says yes to a word, if there exists a legal path that leads to an accepting state. So one way to prune away the things that lead to rejecting states is sometimes just to remove those edges in the graph. But a DFA, by definition, has to have exactly one edge pointing out of each state for each possible symbol. OK. Um, we have to consider every state. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I mean, you could always, as a shorthand, yeah. say, if I haven't drawn an edge, it means you go to a reject state. But strictly speaking, we should count that as one of the states of the DFA because it corresponds to the doomed equivalence class. Okay. <coughs> Keep in mind, by the way, that not every language has a class like this, right? I mean, for instance, the language of all words whose length is even. Well, you're never truly doomed. You can always just add one more symbol if it's odd. So it's just that some of the examples we've seen have a rule like this where if you ever violate it, there's no going back. But not all DFAs are like that. All right, so let's just write down this DFA. So Whichever thing, whichever equivalence class that contains the empty word, that will be our initial state. So far, we haven't read anything. So here's our initial state. I'll draw two circles around it, even though it's number two, it's the initial state. Now, what we need to figure out is what the transitions are. So I claim, and this is part of what I ask you to prove in that homework problem, I claim that if you know what equivalence class you're in now, and I give you one more symbol, that determines what equivalence class you'll be in next. OK? Yes. Which means we can treat them like the states of a DFA. So for instance, if I'm here and I read an A, where do I go? One. One, because one is the set of words that end in an A and are legal so far. So this was say, before the A. So this is legal so far, and you end in a B or nothing. So if I see an A, I go there. If I see a B, where do I go? You go to B. If, if I'm in class 2 and I see a B, okay. I go back to 2. Because yeah. if I ended in nothing or 1 or 2 Bs and I read another B, well, now it's true again that now I end in one or two Bs. So if I see another B, I go back here. Oh, you're at two? OK. Yeah. I thought you were at two. Sorry. Yeah, if I'm at one and I read a B, yeah, then okay. I go here. Mm -hmm. What if I'm at one and I read another A? Um, four. You. And you I go to four. four. If I'm at three mm -hmm. and I read an A, where do I go? Uh, four. Do also do. Because three is the state I'm in. If yes, 
the last symbol I read was a B, but the one before that was an A. If I'm in four, then no matter what I read, I stick there. And finally, if I'm in three and I read an A, where do I go? I'm sorry, if, I, if I'm in three and I read a B. To the E and I get to yeah, accept it. I go to two. Go back to the Because now I've read two Bs. Yeah. Okay? So you can kind of see now what's going on, right? We start here. You can have as many Bs as you like. Once you have an A, you now have to go B, B. You have to have those two Bs. And now you can have more Bs if you want. And then you can have another A and two Bs. Um, but if you have, uh, if, if you've only had, if you've immediately had an A or an A and one B, and then you have another A, then you go down here and you never escape. And then finally, what is the accepting states or state? Two. Number two. two. Yeah, two is also the only accepting state. And you're in two if you've never said an A, if you've never seen an A, which that satisfies this rule, right? Because then there are no A's to worry about. Um, or if every time you've seen an A, you've had at least two B's out there, okay? So this is what I'm trying to get you to say in general terms. So in the homework problem, I, I have a specific example where I just ask you to do this same exercise for the no two Bs in a row, our very first example. And then I ask you to, you know, do a little bit of formal stuff and say that, uh, for instance, um, you know, one of the key facts here, right, is that, I mean, let's, let's visualize the universe of all words, which is an infinite set, as having been clumped into these four clumps, okay? Now, in order for this scheme to work, if I'm here and I read a symbol like an A, well, that's a bad example in this case. If I'm here and I read a symbol like a B, I need to know that I always go here no matter which word in this equivalence class I had, right? So the point is the very definition of this equivalence means that two words, in the that if they're equivalent now, and you read one more symbol, they still will be equivalent. Which means that to know what the new equivalence class will be, and therefore the next state, you don't need to look inside. And, and you don't need to know anything about which word you have in here. So there's a little proof to do there. Okay. So the point is, once you see a language, if you can figure out what these equivalence classes are, then that actually gives you a recipe for a DFA that recognizes it. In fact, it gives you a recipe for the smallest possible DFA that recognizes it. Because last time we talked about the fact that if two words end up in the same state, then the DFA can't tell the difference between them ever after, which means if you now read an additional word W, you're either going to accept in both cases or reject in both cases. Okay, which means that they're equivalent in this sense. Okay, so if two words are, are not equivalent, they have to belong to, they have to send the DFA to different states. So these are some of the things so that by, you need to see. By having by the and symmetric, those, those properties you mentioned? Yeah, well that just means that it's, it's a clump. Right, I mean, that's just an, I mean, the probability of, of an equivalent clump, not necessarily, the, I mean, defining. Right, I mean, an equivalence, right, again, this is going back to your discrete math oh, yeah. courses. Like, ha if saying that two integers are the same mod three, yeah. that is an equivalence. Because if A and B are the same mod three and B and C are the same mod three, then A and C are the same mod three. Yeah. And, you know. That's just what equivalence relation is. I just don't want you to hear words like equivalence relation and feel intimidated if it's been a couple of years yeah, since so you took so a discrete math course. I mean, uh, if that, I mean, if, uh, if a relationship in play satisfies those, I mean, properties, I mean, what, what are you doing here is now kind of 
added another extra constraint to this. Well, this is a particular equivalence relation. Relation, okay. But whenever you have an equivalence relation, it divides the world up into equivalence classes, which are the clumps of things that are okay. equivalent. That's, yeah. Okay. But so, I mean, you know, the computer science side of this, I mean, sort of the, the moral here is, you know, it's not sort of the details of, I mean, I mean, the moral here is that we're thinking about how much information do you need to solve the problem of telling whether the input is satisfies this rule or not. And if all you need to know when you're partway through reading the word is whether what you've read so far is in one of three or four different things, that's the same as saying that a DFA with three or four states can recognize it, okay? On the other hand, so here's, here's something for you. So uh, consider the set of palindromes. Palindromes are things that are the same if you write them backwards. So palindromes, well, epsilon is the same if you write it backwards. Um, so are A and B, but then we have, you know, AA and BB and ABA and BAB and BABBBAB and so on, things that are symmetric. So prove to me that the set of palindromes is not a regular language. Prove to me that no finite state automaton can read a word from left to right and tell whether it's a palindrome. I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear. No, no. Okay. I mean, again, oh, yeah. say your intuition first. Don't, don't hold your intuition in silently until you think you can say something mathematical. Infinite number of equivalent clumps. Right, and, and why are there why are there an infinite because number of never kind of doom always can. Well, that's true. You can always you you can all you're never quite doomed. But what's more important is the first thing you said that there are an infinite number of different equivalence classes. Yeah. And why is that? Because you should have more more too much memory, infinite memory actually to to remember that what happened at the beginning, like to to get the symmetry. Exactly. Yeah. You know, you of course you're you're not sure when you're halfway through. Yeah. But I mean, the intuition is that if you're halfway through, you need to remember the entire first half. Yeah. Exactly. Because you need to compare it to the second half. Mm -hmm. And different. So actually, every word is a group. Is yeah. No two words are equivalent to any other here because if a, any two words that are different, well. I mean, need a different solution. Yeah, I mean, you, you need to follow them by different things, or, or you, there might be some things that you can follow them both with, but it won't be the same set of things. In particular, if I follow this one with its mirror image, I get a palindrome, but if I follow this with the mirror image of, of this one, the same thing, it probably isn't. It definitely isn't if they're the same length. Well, anyway, I leave the rest to you. But the point is that, uh, I mean, there's a slight, a slight twist here because we don't know when we're halfway through. But basically, yeah, the, the intuition is you have to remember the entire first half to know if it's legal. And that requires an infinite amount of memory more and more as the words get larger. There's no constant amount of memory which will work for all lengths of words. And that's the proof. Okay. Um, all right, and, and notice that to, to prove that a language isn't regular, to prove that it requires an infinite number of states, you don't need to completely describe all, what all the equivalences are. All you need to do is show me any, any infinite set of words, none of which are equivalent to any of the others. Then we already know that there are an infinite number of equivalence classes. Even if you haven't shown me any, every word, any infinite set, where each one is different from all the others will do. <coughs> yes? Uh, this might sound dumb, but could you reverse a string so you have two Turing machines, one read from left to right and one from right to left? Oh, well, I mean, sure. It, you're absolutely, you know, it's absolutely true that everything we're saying here 
is very dependent on the fact that he, he was asking about what about a machine which sort of, or two machines which work together, or one machine with two reading heads, which start at opposite ends and read in opposite directions. Yeah, that would work. It's just a different model of, you know, to be fancy about it, it's a different model of computation. I mean, to be more reasonable about it, we're focusing here on what finite state machines can do when they're only allowed to move from left to right on the input. And once you get into being able to look at the input at several places simultaneously and move from left to right or right to left or back and forth, then you can do more. And this definition supposes that you can't go back and read U and V, right? That's why this is the right definition of what we need to know so far. And you know, the fact basically, you know, I mean, finite state automata and regular expressions, which I'm about to discuss, are important in a lot of areas, and so that's why we teach them. But it's also sort of a toy example of where we can really prove, we can say exactly what these machines can do and what they can't do. Whereas when we get to the really hard questions like P versus NP, the challenge is that we really don't know exactly what polynomial time algorithms can do. We know some of what they can do, but we don't know exactly what they can do. And it's hard to prove that they can't do something. Whereas for these little toy computers, there's some nice techniques for proving that they cannot solve certain problems. Was there a question over here somewhere? Okay. All right, so let's talk about regular expressions. And then um, if we have time, we'll do a kind of classic thing called the pumping lemma, which is, uh, you know, people would consider it strange if I didn't teach it to you. <laughs> All right, so what's a regular expression? Well, you already know this if you use Emacs. So here's what a regular expression is. Um, uh, let's go back to our no, no two Bs in a row language, okay? Well, let's see, what is a description of all the legal words? Well, um, certainly if you, have an, if you have a B and you follow it by an A, that's okay. Um, also, A's are okay. And you can do either of those things as many times as you like. Okay? So what does this mean? So we actually introduced this star last time. It means do this zero times, zero is okay, or once or twice or any integer number of times, where each time you do it, what this says is do this or this. In some books they use a union here instead of a plus. I don't care. You can use union if you want. Okay. Um, let's see. Does this alone cover all of the words that have no two Bs in a row? What are we missing? A, B, A. Uh, yeah, well, it, it covers A, because you could go through it once and just do A. B without an A. It doesn't cover B, and it doesn't cover A, B. In fact, it doesn't cover anything that ends in B. So at the end of this, I'll say you can do nothing, or you can tack a B on the end. Mm -hmm. Now I think we've got everything, uh, because we be alone, we do this zero times and then do that. Everything else that begins with B, we can get by doing one of those. All right. There are many, many different regular expressions that mean the same language. Okay, this is not unique by any means. I'm sure you can come up with a couple more yourself. Okay, so, well, I like to define things by example. If you want a formal definition, a regular expression, and actually one of the charms of certain manuals about how to use Emacs is that they actually give these little formal, they look a bit like ML code if you're into ML. I mean, a, a regular expression is either just a word or a symbol in the language, so it's either some symbol in the alphabet, or I'm going to write or instead of doing that vertical line that some people like. 
or it looks like a regular expression plus another regular expression, which means you can do this or that, or it's a regular expression inside a star. And by building these things up, you can get any regular expression you want. You can have stars inside stars and so on. And that's the definition of a regular expression. Um, here's a reg what does this regular expression mean? <coughs> All finite words of zeros and ones. What does this one mean? The same. The same, the same thing. thing. This says as many times as you like. You can have as many zeros as you like, and then as many ones as you like. Okay, so that's a regular expression. So, we proved last time that what DFAs can do as a class, DFAs of any constant size equals what NFAs can do, again, as a class of any constant size. I, I want to make this clear that if you focus on a particular size, this isn't true, right? NFAs with three states can do more than DFAs with three states, okay? It's only when we sort of let the size be any constant that this equation holds, okay? All right, so, well, guess what? The languages that can be recognized by DFAs or NFAs are identical to those that can be expressed in this format. Okay. So I'm going to prove one direction of that statement. The other direction is slightly technical, and it's in SIPSR, and it's not that hard, and if you really care, I'll tell it to you in office hours. I'm going to prove one direction, and it will be a proof by induction. It won't, be, it won't be your kind of standard induction where you have something which is true for an integer n and then you show it's true for n plus 1 and therefore it's true for all integers. It'll be a sort of, well, actually kind of a more fun sort of induction which uses this inductive definition of what a regular expression is. Okay? So the point is that um, if L consists... If, if L consists of nothing but this single word consisting of a single symbol, do you believe that this can be recognized by a DFA? Definitely. Good. <coughs> okay. Uh, actually, just for kicks, I'm going to use NFAs. Actually, I don't even really need to do this at all because... Um, so this is the base case of my induction because it's the, it's the base case of the regular expression, right? Regular expressions are things with stars and things with pluses, and they're concatenation. Oh, I forgot concatenations. So, sorry. Or one regular expression followed by another regular expression. So, for instance, BA is a concatenation of two symbols. Okay? This is a concatenation of this and this. All right. So, so this is regular by which I mean according to the definition we know so far. It can be recognized by a DFA. But what did we prove last time? We proved a couple things. One of them I left for you to prove, which is that if L is regular, then L star is. Right? At least for NFAs, this isn't so hard, right? You just, you know, you run, you're running the machine. At a certain point, you start over and run it some more and make sure that each time you did that, you were in an accepting state. And if you can get through the whole word that way, then it can be written as a concatenation of some number of words in the language. And that's what L star means, okay? The empty word or one word in L or the concatenation of two words in L or three words in L and so on. We also showed that if L1 and L2 are regular, then, well, what is this? It's just their union. And like I said, a lot of books call it the union, which is maybe better notation. We showed that the union was. And um, by the way, there's kind of two nice ways to see that the union is regular. 
So one way is to do the thing where you run the two machines in parallel with a state space, which is the Cartesian product of their state spaces, and they have to find the one accepts. But another way is with an NFA, where on its very first step, it makes a transition either into the first state of that machine or into that one. So it non-deterministically runs one or the other. Worth saying. And then finally, the concatenation of two languages are also regular. Okay. Again, what's easiest for concatenation is easiest with an NFA. At some point, you non-deterministically guess that you should jump and start running the second machine instead. And as long as you were in an accepting state, you ran an accepting state, blah, blah, blah. Well, do you agree now that we've proved by induction that any language which can be written with regular expressions, where regular expressions are concatenations of regular expressions or unions of them or stars of them or single symbols, can be recognized by a finite state automaton? And happily, because of last time's results, I don't need to specify whether I mean deterministic or non-deterministic because they're equally powerful. Okay. The converse is harder. The converse is slightly tricky. Basically, what you do is you take, you know, you take whatever the machine is and you start contracting it. And the idea, for instance, is that if you can go from here to here with a symbol A, we might as well say that we can go from here to here with A star instead. And if I can go from here to here with B and here to here with C, I can get rid of this whole thing and say instead that I can go directly from here to here with B, A star, C. And by doing this iteratively, you sort of contract the machine while writing, instead of symbols, you start writing regular expressions on the edges and you end up with something which just has start state, accept state, and the regular expression, whatever it is, written on that edge. I won't go through the details, but I hope you see the idea. So it's like an extended transition function. I mean, there's just a start state. And yeah, I mean, Sipser calls these GFAs for generalized finite state automata, where the transition function is, you know, right, instead of just single symbols, it has regular expressions for each transition. What about the complement of uh, further expression? Shouldn't that be also in the definition? Interesting point. So um, it's true that we could include it, and it would still be regular. It's not traditionally included, though, because you don't actually need it. Um, but it is true that if you're doing like a regular expression search in Emacs, do you still do that? Does anyone do that? Even my Mac, my little Mac word processor, someone made a regular expression find and search and replace window for it. I'm not sure if anyone uses it. but um, Yeah, it would be handy to have the complement. It's an interesting fact, which I will not prove, that if I give you the complement as one of the ingredients in a regular expression, your regular expressions can be far more compact. So it's sort of like, um, it's a little bit like the DFA, the smallest DFA that, sim that recognizes the same language that a certain NFA recognizes can sometimes be exponentially bigger. So it turns out that, you know, this is not so much about computation, it's almost more about logic somehow. So, I mean, this is a scheme for describing sets of words. If I give you more primitives like complement, and then you can start nesting that inside other things, and then complementing those, and so on, right? I mean, you could have some language here and that, and then I have star, and then I put a complement over that, and then I add something else, and then I put a star around that, etc. This gives you a more powerful language. It's true that everything it can express is still a regular language, but you can express certain things much, much more succinctly with a lot less ink than if I don't give you compliment. I won't prove it, but I think that's a, a charming fact.
Um, you know, it, it, it's it's like saying it's sort of like saying here are two programming languages. Uh, eventually, they can do the same things, but this one, um, because it allows certain other primitives, I can write much much shorter programs than this one. So qualitatively shorter, like exponentially shorter. All right. So um, to conclude today, I want to show you uh, um, one other nice fact about regular languages, which is sort of uh, another standard tool for proving that a language isn't regular. And it's called the pumping lemma. And well, it's a good exercise to learn and apply the pumping lemma. Um, it says this. It says, if L is regular, then there exists. I like these upside down E's and A's. Okay. This is just shorthand. There exists a constant P such that for all words in the language, if the length of w, this just means the number of symbols of w, is bigger than p, then w is the concatenation of three words, x, y, and z, such that for all t, where now I mean just integers bigger than or equal to 0, if I make a new word by taking x and now repeating y t times instead of just once and then z, this word is also in the language. All right. In English, if you have a long word in a regular language, there's some part in the middle which you can repeat as many times as you want. Okay. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's, it's good to be able to handle these formal statements. So let's prove this. Um, <clears throat> so... Tell me intuitively why this is true, and what p is. What is this number p? Number of minimum number of letters. Minimum number of letters. Uh, w is the name. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I mean, yes. I mean, that's that's what that's what it is in the statement of this theorem. But um, if I have a regular language, I mean, what is p going to be if my regular language is, you know? The thing we did today with uh, every A has to be followed by two Bs. Is the, number, is the minimum number of states that you need to reach the except state? Yes. So, so here's our proof. So we're going to assume L is regular. So L is recognized by some deterministic finite state automaton M. Okay. What should I say next? <coughs> so, uh, so let let p be the number of states of m. Uh, it's kind of like the pigeonhole principle. You have more input than you do states. Yes. So let me first uh, state it without that, and then. So I mean, the point is that you're you're walking around in on the states of M, reading the symbols of W, the first symbol of W, the second symbol of W. This generates some path. If the number of steps in this path is bigger than the number of states, well, you have to have visited the same state twice somewhere. You have to have a loop. There's no avoiding that. 
So at some point, you have to have come back here. And then maybe you did something else from there. I mean, you might, you know, might go like that. And then you finally end up in an accepting state. So here's the initial state, some accepting state. Well, so the point is that this initial thing here before the loop is x, the loop is y, it's a deterministic machine, right? So if you come back to the same state and read the same symbols again, you'll follow exactly the same path again. So you can follow it as many times as you like. In fact, t can even be 0. You could skip the loop and go directly to z, which is this part. Okay. Now, obviously, we could state this more formally, but this is the heart of it. Um, I mean, one way to state it more formally, a notation that you'll see sometimes, including in Sipser, is that just as we have this transition function, which takes the current state and tells us where we end up with after one step, well, I could define a new word which takes a current, a, a new function which takes a state and an entire word, and it just tells us where we go after that whole word. I mean, that's a handy shorthand instead of saying delta of delta of delta of delta of delta with each of the symbols of W. And the point is, well, let's look at where we get after one step, after two steps, after three steps, after four steps. Well, if there are more of these than there are states, two of them have to be the same. And that's the pigeonhole principle. The pigeonhole principle is that if you have uh, n holes and m pigeons, where m is bigger than n, and every pigeon wants to, uh, not very good at drawing pigeons, every <laughs> pigeon wants to be in a hole, well, there, have to, there has to be at least one hole with two pigeons. That's the pigeonhole principle. Okay? I mean, I know that you, know, you probably don't even need to feel like you have to give that principle a name, but that's its name. So here, the pigeons are the places we end up with after reading the first symbol, the first two symbols, the first three symbols of the word. The holes are the states. If W is longer than P, and P is the number of states, then two of these pigeons end up in the same place, which means there's two initial sections, one short and one long, of W, which take us to the same place. And what's in between is a loop which we can repeat as many times. So, you know, if we can call this state here s and then delta star of s comma y equals s, and therefore for any t, this is also true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, from there delta star with z leads you to the same accepting state that you would have gotten to. And that's the proof. If t is zero, then you go directly from x to two. That's okay. What matters is that you end in this accepting state. Uh, yeah. So, um, uh, so let's see. Now, it's important to see how this works, though. I mean, I know that the proof is not hard. The question is, um, can we, when is this not true? I mean, there's several nested quantifiers here. These are called quantifiers yeah. for all and there exists. So what it's, I mean, I could have even said for all regular languages, then I would have had even another quantifier. Right? So for each regular language, there's a constant p. It's different for different languages because some languages require DFAs with more states, in which case you can go for longer before you hit a loop. But for each language, if it is regular, there's some finite state automaton that recognizes it, so there's some P. Once you know that P, now for any word longer than that, there's some section which can be repeated as many times as you like. By the way, there's a couple extra things we can say here. We can also say that the length of X is less than or equal to p, because x is supposed to be the part without any loops, 
we can also say that the length of z. So actually, it's it's not just that we can. Um, oh, actually, I, I'm, I'm sorry. We don't know both of those things because there could be sort of uh, several different loops. But we know that the location of the first loop, uh, the stuff that's before the first loop, can be at most p things long. So not only is there something you can repeat, but it shows up fairly soon. And uh, we also know that the length of the loop itself, the smallest loop that you can uh, repeat, is also less than p, right? Okay. So I mean, if w is a long word, it could have one loop here, which we could repeat if we wanted, and then another loop here, which we could repeat if we wanted. And that after that, a third loop here, which we could repeat if we wanted. Yeah. But the first one, the section of the word before the first one, has to be less than p in length. You have to? Or you can just say play? Well, you could also look at the last one, in which case this little tail would be less than or equal to p. Yeah, yeah. I mean. But you don't know. Um, if we just simply choose, like, the last loop to be y, it seems like. Then you could say that, the, that y and z would both have length less than or equal to p if you chose to focus your attention on the last loop. Uh, yeah. Anyway. But, you know, we don't necessarily even need to care about these things. Yeah. All right. So, um, so now, now that we have this, I know that the equivalence class thing the equivalence class thing is in a lot of ways more fundamental, right? So with the equivalence class thing that we had before, it was really an if and only if. The, the language is regular if and only if. That equivalence has a finite number of equivalence classes. This, this is not an if and only if. It could be that this is true of a language, but that it's still not regular. Okay. So showing that this is true of a language is not a proof that it's regular. It's only the other way. Um, but so now let's use this just to prove that the, the following language is not regular. So what is this? This is the language of a bunch of A's followed by an equal number of B's. It's not A star B star because the stars don't talk to each other. There's no constraint on the number of A's versus the number of B's. But here, they're required to be the same. No. So yes, I know you could easily use the previous approach, right, mm -hmm. to show that things are not equivalent. Yeah. But let's use the pumping lemma instead. Okay. So, so this is not regular. Proof by contradiction. Suppose it were regular. English is rapidly losing it, the last vestige of the subjunctive voice. But the correct thing to say is suppose it were, not suppose it was. In six more months, it'll be suppose it was. But that's still not quite grammatical yet. Also, people say dived now. Past tense is dove. It's very sad to lose these little irregularities. I mean, this is the personality of the language. <laughs> um, OK, suppose it were regular. Then according to the pumping lemma, there would be some p such that blah, blah, blah. OK, so now I want, to, I want you to imagine yourself in a kind of debate, it's apropos for the season. You're in a debate with someone who says it's regular. OK? Well, if it's regular, the pumping lemma holds. So you are challenging your opponent to present this number p to you. OK? He or she claims that there exists a constant p. So you say, OK, show me p. All right, so p is whatever your opponent claims it is in the pumping lemma. So then, you know, let p be the constant in the pumping lemma, be whatever it is. Okay. Now, let w equal, give me something which is at least as long as p, but which can't be pumped. So 
So a, a member of this language. N equals P. Yeah. So let W be PAs. I'm sorry. I didn't say this. is a shorthand for PAs in a row. Followed by PBs. Okay. Notice it's not enough to say let W be AAA followed by BBB. Because then your opponent could say, oh, well, P is bigger than 3. It's bigger than 6. You have to let your opponent, you have to challenge your opponent. Let your opponent walk him or herself into a trap by naming the constant P, which they say exists. Then you reply with a word W, which is longer than that, which will not have the properties that your opponent says all words that are longer than P have. Okay. <laughs> So now it's your opponent's turn. The ball is in their court. You say, well, let W be PAs followed by PBs. It is now up to your opponent to say how to write W as the concatenation of X, Y, and Z. You say, all right, I'll grant you that. Okay. So we'll write this X, Y, and Z. Now your opponent says, that y can be repeated t times for any t, and it will still be in the language. Well, notice that your opponent says that that's true for all t. All you need to show is one example which fails. Let's take t equal 2. Okay. Well, the point is, here are a bunch of a's and then a bunch of b's. Where's y? It's either here, or it's here, or it's here. And now, now we've won. We've won the game, right? Because if it's entirely here and we repeat y twice, we now have more a's than b's, vice versa if it's here. And if it's here, we might have the same number of a's and b's, but we'll switch back and forth. We'll have some a's and then some b's, and then when we repeat y, we'll again have a's and then some b's. And we're not allowed to have that. We have to have a block of a's followed by a block of b's. Okay. So this is a good exercise in dealing with these quantifiers. Later on, we'll see that if you have a logical sentence that goes something like, there exists an x such that for all y, there exists a z such that for all w, blah, 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 such something is true, then proving or disproving the sentence really is a game. And in fact, we'll see that telling whether the current player has a winning strategy in games like chess, or Go, or Hex, or Othello, or lots of other board games, has a high level of computational complexity that's associated with these alternations of for all there exists. Because after all, if it's my turn, what does it mean to say that I have a winning strategy? It means that there's a move I can make right now, there exists, such that no matter what you do, for all moves that you could reply with, there exists some way for me to reply, such that for all, all ways that you could reply, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, ending in I checkmate you or, or take over the board with my territory or whatever the definition of winning is. Okay. So when you, face, when you face these quantifiers, it's really very helpful to use a bit of personification and to imagine that there is a player who's trying to prove this. That player, it is that player's obligation to present P. It's their move. Then it's your move. You get to invent W. Well, they say there, is a way, there exists a way to write it as X, Y, Z. It's their move. They get to choose how to divide it up in X, Y, Z. But now they say that it's true for all T. Aha, it's your move. All you need to do is show one T for which it's false. And if you have a winning strategy in that game, you have a proof. Okay. So we'll, we'll return to that a lot later on. Okay, um, office hours, today and tomorrow. Um, again, you're encouraged to collaborate with others on the homework as long as you write your solutions and also write on your homework who you collaborated with. And if you're registered in the class, please take one of this, these. If you're not registered and you want one, let me wait a day or two because we based the number of copies on the registration. But if you really want one, we can print one out for you.
will courier some up there.